Jai Baba. Jai Baba. Tonight, live from the Amplifier Mir Baba Center in LA, we have my old pal, Jack C. Small, is going to talk to you. Yay! Jack, you should probably introduce Billy for those of you here who don't know him. All right. Um, Billy. <laughs> Billy Gray. Yeah. Yay, Billy. We're going to move to Myrtle Beach because there's to get totally destroyed. Okay? Full effacement will be will happen in Myrtle Beach. Uh, I have one thing to say to start out with. Thank you. <laughs> Get around me, everybody. Get around me while I preach some. Feel a sermon coming on me. The topic will be sent, and that's what I'm again. If you wanna hear my story, then say. Oh. 
for me and you. And I say, think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see clouds of white and skies of blue, the bright blessed day, the dark sacred night, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky, are also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, Babies cry, watch them go. They'll learn much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself. What a wonderful world. Hey, Bob. Hey. Woo. story of, uh, I love this, this story, it's, it's from a book that, uh, I'll think of her name in a moment, this woman from England, it was children's stories of uh, how to remember God, and she tells the story of this one master, or this one lover of God, that was so involved in remembering God that he forgot about himself, he even forgot that he was loving God. That's the example that we get from the mind, of the, like Bauji. We're so fortunate that he comes here so often, we hope more often, that they forget that they're loving God. I remember this one quote that I saw about this. It said, don't worry if you don't remember me, I will be remembering you. <laughs> and we've given our lives to him. We don't have to worry anymore. But we do have to make an effort. Because he says a part of his grace is our efforts. And coming at the center, is a way of our efforts in remembering me and him. And I'm just really thrilled that such a place exists. And I know that you've gone through a lot of heartache, a lot of work in putting this together. I mean, what's the timing of the program? You think about 9.30, excuse me? Can you run out of songs? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Dave, tell her. Tell her. <laughs> Dave's over. <laughs> Having a center like this, I'm so impressed with, what was the name of the treasurer? Kanji. 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 He's right. in the back room working, it's sort of like. Okay. I'm very impressed. And you need a balance of heart and mind to run a center like this, don't you? Really speaking. <laughs> <laughs> as important as mind is, What's really the most important? You gotta have heart. What a great idea. <laughs> yeah, you gotta have heart. All right. <laughs> need some water. What I want is, you gotta have heart. All you really need is heart. When the odds are saying you'll never win. That's when the grin should start. You gotta have hope. Must sit around hope. Nothing's half as bad as it may appear. Wait till next year and hope. When your luck is batting zero, get 
kicked the chin up off the floor. Mister, you can be a hero. You can open any door. There's nothing to it but to do it. You gotta have heart, miles and miles and miles apart. Oh, it's fine to be a genius, of course, but keep that old horse before the car. First, you gotta have heart. First, you gotta have heart. Show business. <laughs> There's no business. <laughs> Great idea. Marguerite said I could go into vaudeville. Well, we're forgetting everything else. Yeah. We're into show business. Unfortunately, vaudeville's dead. Well, the song, believe it or not, I'll share, okay? And, uh, I always had trouble with this song, getting the last line. Uh, still, it's a challenge. And this is a song that Baba was played before Baba, one of the few Western songs that was played before Baba. And I could never really get into it. And my teacher, uh, Debbie, said that what you have to do is you have to get into the feeling of the song, of what people are feeling. And one day, I had one of those days at the trust office, now, believe it or not, uh, it may not seem like there's a ping pong table at the trust office, but there is. I've been the ball, I know. <laughs> Whacked around from all over the place, right? And it was one of those days that just like no matter where I turned, uh, bounced back again. And actually, before I do the song, what I want to say is that I never really appreciated the difficulty that pilgrims went through going to India until I became a pilgrim again. Mm -hmm. Living in India, I would think, why don't people come more often? Why don't they stay longer? I mean, now that I'm involved in a full life, I realize what a deal it is to make time to go to India. I mean, it's not, and I really appreciate, and I take back all my lack of appreciation of what it was like to uh, you know, to come to India as a pilgrim, because it's a big deal. And I never, you know, after a while you get so used to so many people coming, you didn't really appreciate it. Anyway, there's lots of stories of, of, you know, my going through things and Baba's effacement as a, as a, as a resident. But actually, nothing I ever faced as a resident prepared me for living in America. And, you see, in India, the chips that Baba did on my ego was like large blocks removed from my ego, right? But I could always escape. When I moved to America, there was no escape. Gwendolyn and I got married in 1990. Uh, she had a 18-year-old daughter at the time, and I thought our life was taken care of. Her daughter would be living with. Uh, somewhere else everything was taken care of. And much to my surprise, that didn't quite turn out that way. As Baba said that man proposes and God disposes. And I learned something in America, and it's still an ongoing process. You see, uh, Craig Ruff, who many of you know, said that uh, Adi couldn't do it, Bauji couldn't do it, the Manli couldn't train me, but now marriage has. <laughs> I became, uh, at the end of my 40s, a stepfather. And as circumstances turned out, Gwendolyn and I moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and Anna, her, her daughter, ended up living upstairs. And all my efforts to be cheerful, to accent the, the positive, <laughs> all that, you know, it didn't work. <laughs> and, you know, as charming as I could be to business people and 
schmooze them, so to speak, and relate to them, so to speak, it somehow didn't work at home. Uh, they say that when, when somebody has a problem, the only time they'll ever really make a change is when they bottom out, when they have no choice. Like somebody who's an alcoholic, for example, you tell them, friend, you've got a little drinking problem. Uh, you got to change, you say, no, I don't have a problem. Everything's fine. When does that alcoholic want to change? When he's finally at the very bottom, he's desperate. If everything's, he's lost everything, he has no hope, then he seeks help. So I was totally miserable living in the household there with, with Gwendolyn and her daughter. No matter what I tried to do, no matter how nice I tried to be externally, it didn't work. It didn't work with her daughter. And I finally bottomed out in, I remember around Christmas of 1995. I asked Baba's help from the bottom of my heart. I said, I'm totally miserable. Something's got to change. What can I do, Baba? I can't stand this anymore. It's so painful living here. And I felt Baba say to me, it's not that I hear words, but the way Baba will communicate to me, I'll get like a message. He'll clothe his messages to me in my own thoughts. Does that make sense? And I felt him say that love is the only answer. And I felt him say to me, and said, love is the only answer. So I asked his help. Help me to love Anna. Nothing else has worked. I've been trying for years. Nothing works. And, you know, I can't write her. I can't do anything. No matter what I do, nothing works. And so, every day, day after day, circumstances come up, and I would ask Baba to help to love, to feel love. This is still an ongoing process. I was love death and love challenge now in that area. It's an ongoing process, but at least I see the direction. She wouldn't change. She didn't need to change. I was the one that needed to change. And that's the only thing that works. I mean, there's no the justification, as Bhaji says, nothing works. And I'm just constantly challenged. Circumstances still come up that will irritate me, will upset me, but now. I'll laugh at it. I'll remember my promise to Baba, his guidance to me. Nothing works but change of the heart. We cannot change anybody else's heart. We can only change our own heart. And uh, this is the one prayer I realize Baba does answer. This is the one prayer he does answer. If we want to experience love for somebody, Passion for somebody, understanding for somebody. If we ask him for this, this is what he gives. This is what he gives to us. This is a specialty. This is what he's come for. It doesn't mean we don't ask him to help us with our businesses, our careers, and those external things. But he's waiting for us to ask him, please give me love for this person that I have such trouble with that I can't feel love for. He's waiting for each one of us to ask for that. And I'm going to somehow tie this in into that song I was going to say that I had trouble getting into this feeling of the song. And I remember leaving the trust office and suddenly I started to sing this song that Bob had been played before Bob, but Bob had heard the original recording of this. And found myself almost in tune with the song because I could understand the feeling because I felt that downtrodden, that ground under, that I could sense the feeling of this song. And I guess that's how I felt December of 1995. I felt so down. That I had no choice but to be open to him. Have you ever had that experience? When do we ask, you know, when do we get down on our knees? We have no choice. Oh, 
Really, uh, the story she tells of is that uh, Bob had dropped the body, of course, and I heard of you know stories of Henry Kenmore, Harry Kenmore, and I wanted to you know meet him. I was on the way to India. I went to New York, and they were having like a celebration, and I went up to Harry afterwards. You know he's blind, and I said, Harry, how you doing? Nice to meet you, Jay Baba. Nice to meet you. You know, I thought because he's blind, you know, he's into touchy feely, that sort of thing, right? Touchy, he's deaf too. Hmm? And he's deaf, and I would, you know, how you doing, Harry? How are things going? Jay Baba, nice to see you. My name's Jack Small. You met Baba, tell me some something, you know, usual kind of stuff, right? And later on that evening, we went to the society, and I was next to him. And then what he did, he's blind, I don't know how he did this. He said, and one thing you never do, something like that is you never touch anybody with his fist. <laughs> he went just by my face like that. Just, I found out later on that he didn't like to be touched. <laughs> and apparently I put his rib out too. <laughs> by being so affectionate, by being so <laughs> friendly, nice, you know, kind of California, you know, group, and so, you know, that sort of thing. And I thought, my God, when I heard that, I was so glad to get out of New York that I'd never, never again I'm going to go near Harry Kenmore. So here we are. It's my, you know, really long time stay in India. I plan to be there for two months. The moment I get a telegram, that guess who's coming to India for a month or two? Harry Kenmore. So he comes to India, he stays at Marizad, and he's introduced to all the two or three, four pilgrims. That's all there were, of, right? And he said, this is Jack Small. I said, Small? <laughs> he suddenly remembered <laughs> my, my voice and me. So I spent, that's actually the last time, well, so I spent the summer with, with Harry Kenmore remembering me. And finally, and we would have lunch together, you know, where the men mindly stay. There was, there was no porch or veranda where, where the pilgrims would sit. It wasn't covered at the time. And, 
the two or three pilgrims that were there would sit uh, would sit with uh, with the Mandi, and Harry was there. I remember Vila would have food sent over especially just for Harry, even though he was living there at Marigod. And uh, well, the Mandi who was dividing the food. Imagine I can't remember her name. Not yet. Very sweetly, she'd bring food over for everybody and bring Harry's food over. And she'd go like this to me because, you see, I got food from, uh, from Vila's too because we were staying in Vila's. I got peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> uh, whereas Harry would get real food, you know. And so she'd go real sweetly, you know, and like this, and she'd slide over some of Harry's food to me. So, uh, we had this give and take, you know. I would take his food from Nadia, right? <laughs> and he would give me lots of remembrances of Mayor Baba. Finally, after a month or two, <laughs> <laughs> finally, uh, after a month or two, he called me small. And I was very touched that he actually addressed me by, you know, my suffix, my name, you know, small. Otherwise, hey, you. And I was like, you know, somehow, even though he's blind, I still try to avoid his gaze. Being around him, but there was like only two or three, four pilgrims there, you know. And he reminded me of you know our wonderful experience together in New York. Anyway, we were talking about being grateful to the Lord, right? Um, being happy, remembering Him. There's a song, surprise, and it's a song which helps us be remember and be appreciating of our Lord. So, any of you who know the song. Feel free to join me. And this helps us to appreciate what we get from him. The Lord is good to me, and so I thank the Lord for giving me the air we breathe, the rain, the sun, and the apple trees. The Lord is good to me. I owe the Lord so much for everything I see. I'm certain if it weren't for Him, there'd be no apples on this land. The Lord is good to me. Oh, here I am, need the blue, blue sky, doing as I please. Singing with my feathered friends, humming with the bees. I wake up every day as happy as can be. Because I know that with this care, my apple trees will still be there. The Lord is good to me. So what do we do when we wake up in the, in the morning? We wake up every day <laughs> as happy as can be. Because we know that with this care, our apple trees will still be there. The Lord is good to me. J. Bob, J. Bob. Have any questions? I can tell people are dying for questions. Thank you. What about um, the last time with Adi? Well, last time was with Adi. That was an Adi story. An Adi story. Yeah. Um, anybody hear the story of the train ride with Steve Barry? Let's hear um, you. There was this uh, trip that Adi had been invited to. Uh, Andhra, uh, and whenever possible, I would try to invite people to join and spend time with Adi and me. Uh, any of you who were around at the time might wonder, why, why is Jack Small always trying to get you know Adi to, to, to get us to sit with him during meals, doing some stuff like that? You see, as often as I could get people around Adi with me, Adi wouldn't focus on me. <laughs> now. Honestly, Gwen, you hear me when I eat my food, make a noise with my jam. Yeah, you hear it? Okay. Adi said that whenever I would chew my food, there would be some sort of noise I would make with my jaw. I mean, that's what I would make. TMJ disorder. TMJ disorder. How did it go away when, I, when Adi cast it? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, anyway, Adi would always criticize the way, you know, my jaw would sound, sound when we would eat together. He would always find something to, you know, remind me of my uh, frailties. And so, what I always try to do 
whenever we go on a trip, if possible, I would try to invite other people along with uh, Adi to join us. With TFJ. Hmm? the other people would have it <laughs> yeah, no, he, no, he only noticed of me. Didn't notice of me. <laughs> because I had said to him, you know, treat me the way Baba treated you. Nobody was foolish enough <laughs> to say that, right? So uh, I remember uh, Steve Barry had come to America, and one of his suitcases had been kept it was delayed. Actually, to be quite honest, it, it was a suitcase that he carried, but it didn't have his things in it. It had some of my things in it. Steve was very kind enough to bring to India. And so the way we would get to Andhra is we'd take a train from Ahmednagar and we would uh, go to a place called Don. And by the way, this is the, some of you may be familiar with the book Welcome Home. This is sort of the origin of this book Welcome Home, this little story. Okay. And so what you do is you take a train from Ahmednagar to Don, get off at Don, and then catch it another train that originates from Bombay that goes to Hyderabad. Now the problem was, was how do you always, even though you have reservations, sometimes people are already in the seat in, uh, that's originating from Bombay, it's hard to, get, hard, to, hard to get them to leave. So sometimes Adi would deliberately make a trip to Bombay in order to catch that train. I said to Adi that we're going to, uh, Steve's forgotten one of his suitcases, I did mention that it had my goodies in there. Right? <laughs> in fact, this reminds me of another story. <laughs> is when we were in America, I can't remember this man's name, but uh, and I was touring out with Adi in America, and somebody gave me a clock, a little nice little portable travel clock. And I said, look at Adi, what this person gave me. And he looked at it, and he took it. <laughs> and so he was like, you know, used to, you know, he would show things to Bob, and Bob would confiscate him. So I wasn't always up front with Adi about the things that I got. <laughs> In fact, Craig will tell the story. Did you tell the apple pie story when he was here? No. Okay. Uh, the apple pie story? Okay. Uh, Gordon, um, what's his last name? Gordon Campbell, if anybody knows Gordon Campbell. Mm -hmm. Gordon Campbell was living in the compound at the time. Craig Ruff was there and I was there. And uh, Gordon was a good cook. And, you know, one of the things he would do every now and then was make apple pies, right? So he made this special apple pie, and it's very complicated because you have the stove, it's not really an oven, you know, and he made this apple pie. So we're all set to go to sleep, it's about 10.30 at night, and, uh, you know, we're all about to go to sleep, and, you know, Adi comes to our door and opens the door, and he's in his, you know, pajamas in this kind of, kind of uh, Victorian hat, you know, it looks quite charming, right? And he says, he's hungry, I'm hungry, do you have any food? And he says, no, I don't think there's anything there. So, somehow, mystically, he turns to where the oven is, where the pie is. He, you know, opens the door, pulls out the pie, sets it on the table, and eats the center of the pie. <laughs> and I just told him a few minutes later that there was nothing to eat. <laughs> now, I don't, can't remember if I really knew the pie was there, or I wouldn't consider offering that he'd be interested in pie at that late. But he was, okay? So anyway, uh, I told Adi that we're going. To, I want to go to Bombay to help Steve get his things right. That were in Bombay. Also, I want to tell the story. I'm backtracking a little bit. Uh, we'd gone to this trip in in 1976. Uh, Pete Townsend had invited Adi to England, and. Uh, Adi <coughs> said to Pete that he wanted to, uh, he needed somebody to assist him. And uh, he said, who would that be? And he said, Jack Small. So this whole arrangement had been made. Pete Townsend invited Adi to England for the opening of the Oceanic Center. Okay. And we're getting ready for the trip. And uh, I noticed that somehow none of the other Mondelein knew that Adi was going to England. And I said to Adi, Adi, uh, Mani, Eric, others, they don't know about this trip. And he looked at me like, well, so what? <laughs> and, you know, time's, I mean, time's happening. We're like, first we're a month away from the trip, then we're three weeks, three weeks away from the trip. And I said to Adi, uh, they don't know that you're going to England. Do you want to tell them? And he said, looked at me like, 
what business is it of mine? <laughs> you see, uh, coming from California, being a lawyer, and thinking that, you know, if everybody just talked to each other, everything would get along fine. Everybody would be, you know, it's just a matter of getting everything out in the open. I thought I, you know, had the solution to help the mind to get along with each other, right? And I said, Adi, uh, you should tell him. You, I'll tell him. Is that okay with you? He said, you do what you want, right? Uh, well, that's, you know, when, when the Mandis say, you know, you ask them to do something, they say, do what you want. It's kind of like, you know, Bob has hinted what should be done, right? And you keep pestering him. And then he says, you know, you know, do what you want, and then you suffer the consequences. So I went to Adi, and, and I mean, I went to uh, Mani and Erich. I said, by the way, Adi is going to England, you know, in three days. <laughs> And they got so upset, they, they thought it was me who was doing this, that set this up. And the thing is, their concern was for Adi's health, because he had had a heart attack some years ago, and also he's involved in, you know, so many things that they're involved in. And they wanted to know these things, and obviously Adi would have told them at his time, yet it was me who think, thought that I needed to tell, you know, that they needed to know when they needed to know, whatever it was. So I learned a big lesson, just kind of, well, I never really completely learned that lesson, <laughs> to be quite frank. <laughs> But I at least learned the lesson not to tell about Adi's trips, right? <laughs> that much I learned, okay. So we go through that trip. Then John Page writes a letter to me uh, in the early, early 1977 and says to me that, uh, are any of the Mon do you know any of the Mondi who would want to come to America? Who would like to have one of the Mondi come to America? So I take this letter to Adi and I show it to him. And he says, yes, I'll go to America. And this is kind of the history of how Adi got here in that 1977 trip. Okay. And I said, fine, you know. So I was doing the correspondence back and forth. And, uh, uh, you know, everything's being arranged. And sure enough, again, you know, this is like a big deal now. That's just England, you know. We're going to stop in England and we're going to stop in America. And uh, this whole tour in America. And nobody's telling Merazat Mandali. Adi's not telling the Mandali. I certainly learned my lesson not to tell the Mandali, right? So the mail would come sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon. I remember we're having tea. And a letter comes from John Connor writing to uh, Monty Nares, you know. Say, and isn't it wonderful that Jack Small is bringing Adi to America? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's the first inkling that the Mandali have of. Adi coming to America. And again, of course, it's sort of obvious, right, that to them I set it up. Did I set up? I don't know. John wrote, I don't know. Anyway, so it was a big deal. They talked to each other, talking in, you know, Mani and Erich and Adi and Gujarati, the whole thing, right? And Mani gets very upset at me. He said, What are you doing? Why are you interfering? Why don't you? And, I, and I said to Mani, This had nothing to do with me. I didn't do this, I didn't initiate this. Now, was I fully truthful to mine when I said that? I was just really scared. I was really scared, frankly. <laughs> I was stricken. I didn't want to take the responsibility. I did take the letter to Adi. Uh, I didn't take it to anybody else. So, anyway, she asked me, was this your idea? Did you have anything to do with this? With this? And I said, Mani, I looked at Mani in the eye. And I said, no, Mani, I had nothing to do with this. And I have to say, that I wasn't fully truthful to Mani. And it may not have been the first or the last time <laughs> that I wasn't fully truthful, forthcoming to Mani, or all the Mani. And I confessed my weakness publicly. And it was a wonderful trip. It was a great trip. However, it's interesting how Baba does things. Uh, and I was really into the trip. In fact, the whole deal at the time was that, you know, the Sahabas was paying for the expenses, right? And so what we, we did is we didn't make any other appointments for any other place until the Sahab, so everybody was here at the Sahabas gathering. The whole country was waiting to see Adi, but we didn't make any other appointments so that everybody would come to the Sahabas first, right? It was the first, the first time it held in Adi. Oh, in 77? Yeah. Okay. And so what we did was then people came from all over the country and we started making appointments. And I started, basically, uh, I'd been out of touch, out of America for two years and I wanted to meet all my friends. 
and have fun and all that kind of stuff, you know, hanging out with Adi and all the Baba lovers. So we would, you know, I'd schedule things, you know, like two weeks in Northern California, and we'd just travel along different places. And it was like the whole trip turned out almost six months long, including another trip to, to India. I mean, to, to England on the way back. And, you know, I was really excited about it, but gradually, week after week, month after month, you see, with Adi, I had to be totally conscious, aware of where he was all the time. I remember when we were in Northern California at the box. Uh, again, Richard Chapman, some other people, Robert Trappist, uh, Ben Wright, and others were, you know, they wanted to take Adi out. And I said, well, why don't you guys be alone with Adi? You know, I'm always around, you know. Again, I was very generous, wanted to share Adi, right? Wanted everybody to have fun with Adi without me, you know. So I arranged for them to, you know, take care of Adi alone, and I was free to leave me. And I can't remember her name, but somebody invited me to go up to a party out dancing with them. And I thought, hmm, this is the opportunity. But for some reason, something else came up and I didn't go. Okay. So Adi comes back, everybody had a good time, and I asked Adi what happened, and I mentioned, he asked me what happened, I mentioned this girl that, you know, was having some party, inviting me to go out dancing, that sort of thing. He looked at me, he was so stunned. He said, had I gone dancing with, out with them, he would send me back to India. I was so stunned by that. Because this is what he was, I mean, think of it. You know, Bob was traveling with the Mondli, and Bob would go somewhere, and wanted the Mondli go out dancing. You know, that was the kind of life, you know, that was the expectation that he had for me. And I did think later on that I was grateful he didn't say he sent me back to Los Angeles, not that I didn't love all of you. <laughs> but he threatened to send me back to India. That was some consolation. So anyway, you see, gradually, after a period of time, it started to wear on me in terms of always being conscious where Adi was all the time. And I got the feeling of what the atmosphere, the flavor of what was the Manli traveling with Baba. How they had to always be alert, conscious of where he was. I remember uh, Janet Luck said to me, Oh, we were in Chicago, aren't you happy you're going to the next place? This was four months on the trip. I wasn't excited at all. It was starting to get to me. And uh, finally we got, to, we returned to America, I mean to India. And I remember I was so frazzled, by it. it was kind of like the spring had been wound and wound and wound tight. Finally we got to the trust compound, I could relax. There was other people to look after Adi. And I don't know what happened, I think of, this happened to me once or twice in my life, which my mind, it's like, like snap, in a sense, like my mind was just so, was so unwound, you know, I just had to sit at Adi's desk. I said, I just wanted to be with you, Adi. My mind can't stop going, I'm so exhausted. I was so, so burned out, I guess is the expression. In fact, some Baba lovers invited Adi to Iran at the time. And I was so out of it that Adi turned to me and said, Would it be okay if I took Jackal with me? Would you mind? I said, That's fine. I, think. And I was so burned out. And that trip never happened. But eventually, you know, I got a little, a little better and calmed out. Things resolved themselves. Then in 1979, uh, Marshall Hay came to me and said, We'd like to invite Adi to America. Now, you know, I missed her, you know, trips, having fun with Adi and all that. I wasn't into it at all. Uh, two years had elapsed. And I loved Adi, I wanted to be with him. But the thought of another trip, even though it wasn't planned so long, uh, with, you know, just I was not ready for it, two years later. And, of course, Marshall did the right thing. He said, I, I said to Marshall, really, I don't think Adi's really ready for the trip. He's still not recovered from 1997. Talk about myself now. Not even. So Marshall did the right thing. He went directly to Adi, you know, to ignore me. And uh, Adi had, you know, later on told me, you know, and this, I remember he told me, I think this was the, the, the 12th, the Dooney. He said, by the way, we're going to America, you know, in a month or two. I was so, you know, all I could do was rush to the Dooney. <laughs> and I remember bowing down at the Dooney surrendering this upcoming trip to Baba. And I suddenly heard this like gasp 
from the audience, and my hair had caught in fire. <laughs> <laughs> it just singed a little bit. I just went like this, and it, you know. And that's uh, the story of travels with Adi, with somebody who thought that you know they were ready. And finally, I remember what Gaudi would say. He would say that. Uh, you know, if you want to be close to me, you have to take all this. And whatever was given to you. Finally, I had the courage to say that I didn't have the courage. I finally said that I can't have it anymore. I don't need it anymore. I have to say, I love seeing Bauji here in America. It's so much fun. He's so nice to me. He's so sweet. So many people out here. You know, we all be Bauji together. And living in India, it's a constant focus on your weaknesses, on my weaknesses. And you've already heard Old Man River, so I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> but, Jack, uh, would, would yes. you finish up about the suitcase oh, the that suitcase had your things in it? Suitcase. Oh, right. The <laughs> pie. <laughs> Oh, that's all. It was something to do about not necessarily volunteering information to Adi. There was a point to that story. There was a point to that story. And, uh, we're actually, we're not getting to the song, right? Uh, there was a point to that story. And so I didn't volunteer to Adi that, you know, I, would, I wanted a little time off from him. I wanted to pick up my things. And I need to get the suitcase that Steve Barry had brought. I didn't volunteer that. And so anyway, Steve Barry and I went to uh, Bombay to pick up the suitcase. And so we were hit, we took the train. You see, Chris Pearson was gonna was company, going to accompany us. And so it was uh, Adi, Steve, and Chris and myself. Okay. Um, and you know, I figured, I figured there's enough people around that I wouldn't get you know so much attention from Adi, so much loving attention from Adi. Right? <laughs> And so the idea was that we're going to meet at uh, Dome. Now we unpacked the suitcase, and I went through all my goodies, you know, and all that kind of stuff, you know. And I remember the stuff was spread all over, and we would go from station to station. And I asked the train conductor, "What time would we get to uh, Dome?" And he told us a certain time. He said like eight o'clock, something like that, you know. So we go, and then I, Steve says to me, maybe should, you know, we should gather our things. So I gather things, put everything away. So I'm sitting riding in the train with Adi, we're, I mean, with, with Steve. And Steve says to me, you know, Jack, someday in the future, because of all the time you spent with the Mondali, you know, you'll have lots of stories to tell, and people will appreciate you. And I said to Steve, you know, I was saying, uh, you know, yeah, but that's not important, Steve. What's important is that, you know, uh, we remember Baba, we just serve Baba. But he said, but Jack, really, you're going to play a role in Baba's work in the future. And I said, really, Steve, that's not important. What's important is that, you know, to remember Baba now. Well, Steve sort of kept this up for a while. And after a while, I would start to feel, well, you know, that's true, Steve. I mean, I won't be attached to it, of course, but, you know, <laughs> you know, the, you know people would appreciate me from having spent time with the Monley, but, you know, really, we shouldn't get so involved in that, Steve, but, you know, you're right, Steve. And then we're at this spot, we've been at this one spot for maybe ten minutes, and the whistle's blowing, you know, and I stand up, and I want to say, I wonder, where are we? You know, we're not due in Dome for another hour and a half. I wonder, where are we? And the train's about to take off, so I go to the door, and open up the compartment door, and I'm stunned. There's Adi. Adi and Steve walking up and down. And Adi turns to me and says, Where are you? We've been walking up and down looking for you. The guy, the man had given me the wrong information about the train. I didn't know we were in Doan. And Adi, we grab his luggage. And Adi starts lambasting me. But I was having heart palpitations. What happened to you? Why did you do this? And on and on and on. And Steve described it that my body was slowly sinking. From this being puffed up to feeling so good about myself. <laughs> my future in the you know, as the leader of the bottle world and all that, you know. And slowly my body was sinking. Meanwhile, Steve and Chris were like in the corners trying to avoid a ricochet, you know? 
Uh, and I was kind of like slowly, you know, Adi was just going on and on about how awful I was, how useless I was, how I spoiled this trip and that. I was like sinking, sinking down. And I was like finally sat down in my compartment, you know, on, on the chair and just kind of like humped over like this, getting so depressed, being so bad. Uh, the conductor came to the, to the door and uh, asked, uh, do you want any food? And I said, I want food. And he was feeling so bad. I ordered food for everybody, including me. And again, he went after me. And about half an hour later, somebody came to the door, you know, bought the food. And what Adi did is he took the food and he started feeding it with his own hands. Mm -hmm. So sweet, baby. So lovely. And I completely broke uh, my wounds. This is another song I'd like to share with you all, and this is a song also heard by Bob. And if you think, what will your life be? You know, what's in the future for you? What will you experience? You wonder what's happening day to day. Bob understands. Yes, he knows. He knows. He understands. He understands. When I was just a little boy, I asked my mother, what will I be? Will I be handsome? Will I be rich? Here's what she said to me. Hey, sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Hey, sera, sera, what will be, will be. When I grew up and fell in love, I asked my sweetheart, what lies ahead? Will there be roses day after day? Here's what my sweetheart said. Hey, sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Hey, sera, sera, what will be, will be. Now I have children of my own, they ask their father, what will they be? Will they be handsome? Will they be rich? I tell them tenderly. Hey, sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. What will be, will be. wonderful to know that Baba heard this song and knew that we would hear the song before today, of course, and that, you know, we wonder what our life will be, and he knows that dilemma of what our life will be, and I also can see that it's getting kind of late, but we have a, a song or two more. <laughs> now, it's very simple. We know that we are not the mind or the heart. We know we're not our thoughts. Baba gives us freedom to choose what we want to dwell on, to 
dwell on and act on the first thought of the emotion that we have. It's kind of tantamount to, you know, turning on television and watching the first program that's up there. Who does that? Who does that? We, you know, we get what we want to do. We choose different channels. Now, in my day, there were only three or four channels. Now, there's several dozen. There's soon to be hundreds. Maybe that's, you know, sort of symbolic of the problem we have with dealing with so much thoughts and feelings and emotions. But the point is, we have control. We have freedom of choice as to what channel of our thoughts or feelings we want to act on and focus on. And we have a choice if we want, no matter what feelings or thoughts we have, to focus on Him. You see, it's very simple. We can grab your coat and get your hat. Leave your worries on the doorstep. Just direct your feet to the Baba side of the street. Can't you hear that bitter pat? That happy tune is your step. Just direct your feet to the Baba side of the street. I used to walk in the shade with those blues on parade. But I'm not afraid since this over, crossed over. If I never had a cent, I'd be rich as Rockefeller. Gold dust round my feet on the Baba side of the street. One more time, I used to walk in the shade with those blues on parade. But I'm not afraid since this rover crossed over. If I never had a cent, I'd be rich as Rockefeller. Gold dust round my feet on the Baba side of the street. What side of the street? On the Baba side of the street. J Bob, J Bob. Now again. Um, again, we have many choices, right? What direction do we want to go? Here's a direction you might consider. <laughs> Fairy tales can come true. They can happen to you if you're young at heart. Or it's hard, you will find, to be narrow of mind if you're young at heart. You can go to extremes with impossible schemes. You can laugh when your dreams fall apart at the seams, and life gets more exciting with each passing day, and love is either in your heart or on the way. Don't you know that it's worth every treasure on earth to be young at heart? For as rich as you are, it's much better by far to be young at heart. And if you should survive to 105, think of all you derive out of being alive. And here's the best part, you'll have a head start if you are among the very young. And In conclusion, uh, this is a song that was written uh, and really made famous during World War II, in which we were thought there was all these external enemies outside. And Mir Baba has made us realize there's no external enemies outside. The enemies are within. Our own mind and our own heart. 
And with the establishment of the center, you see, before you were painting. Now the clock has started on this manifestation, which you're actually only in the center here. And God's blessings is on America and this area. And join me. Avatar, 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 Avatar,